Welcome to the Real Python Podcast. This is episode 70. How is Python being used today, and what can you do with the language? Do you want to develop software, dive into data science and math, automate parts of your job and digital life, or work with electronics? This week on the show, David Amos is back, and he's brought another batch of PyCoders Weekly articles and projects. We talk about a Real Python article that covers the incredible variety of ways that you can use Python. David shares an article about the Pythonic way to count objects using the counter class from the collections module. We discuss the ways that can lead to cleaner and more efficient code. We cover several other articles and projects from the Python community, including the inaugural CPython developer in residence, type classes in Python, GitHub Copilot writes a text-based game, friendlier tracebacks in REPLs, including Jupyter, 120 plus interactive interview challenges a module that helps you build complex pipelines of batch jobs, and a tool for plotting inside the terminal. This episode is brought to you by Sentry, helping developers see issues that matter, solve those issues in minutes, and learn insights to keep their applications running at peak performance. All right, let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hey, David. Welcome back to the show. Hey, Chris. Good to be back. All right. We got some really great news to start off this episode. I yeah. wanted to mention previous guest, Lucas Langa is the inaugural CPython developer in residence, or as people keep shortening it, DER, <laughs> which I think is <laughs> kind of strange. So anyway, the, the, the whole idea of the developer in residence that we kind of touched on this developer in residence thing a couple times in news articles and so forth, but it's inspired by Django's fellowship program. I didn't know that at the time yeah. and how successful that was in helping them really make a kind of cohesive changes to and, and improvements in Django, which is really great. I, I mean, Django is, is really moving fast lately, which is, uh, I guess maybe something else you can tell with that. And it adds really a con cohesive contact, which I thought that would be one of the things that it would add. Their goal is to address the PR backlog and, investigate you know what are the priorities of this you know overall project and the initial thing that we'll link to is from psf's sort of announcement about it yeah lucas wrote on his own blog about kinds of things that he's hoping he's going to be able to do and the first was providing a steady review stream which helps dealing with the pr backlog triaging issues on the tracker and dealing with the whole backlog there being present <laughs> You know, being like available for communication channels to unblock people. And that's something that I felt myself with, with remote work. It, it's sort of frustrating tossing things over the wall or, you know, weekends and other things can kind of get in the way. And so if something sits there for a long time, I, I know the frustration that it can have. Keep the continuous integration and test suite in a usable state. Yeah. And keeping on tabs on, you know, where work is needed, being that person who can kind of direct energy. We had, Joanna on last week, and there was this sort of conversation about what should I do as a C Python developer, core developer, and um, I thought that was an interesting talk, and this kind of would be one of those things where he could help maybe provide guidance for that type of person who's coming in and thinking about particular issues that they're interested in, but also maybe somebody there to guide someone in the direction of like this needs help, <laughs> things like that. So very cool. Yeah. So I'm excited for Wukish, and I, I, I'll try to get him on the show again. I had asked him after PyCon to come on about his FM synthesizer, but this would be kind of a neat one-two punch for an episode, potentially. Yeah, and it's it's just exciting news. I mean, it's, like you said, he's the inaugural developer in residence, and I know this has been something that the PSF has been working towards for a very long time. Obviously, you need funding yeah. for that, and it's just exciting that they've gotten to the point where they can, they can actually do this and kick this off. 
So, um, so yeah, congrats to Lucas and congrats to the PSF and, yeah. and Python for reaching this milestone. Yay, Python. <laughs> yeah, it's a big, big milestone. Yeah, totally. Awesome. So I want to start off with my first article and this is a real Python one. It's actually kind of been on the site for a long time and this is like sort of the latest revision of it. It's definitely a timeless idea. And I thought with summer, maybe this would be a nice kind of idea. Also, there's probably people on there out there having a nice uh, summer vacation or some time off and they want to maybe play around with Python or maybe they're checking out this podcast for the first time and like, what is it that I can do with Python? And that's literally the title of the article. What can I do with Python? And one of the things that I love about this article, it's by uh, Laodonis, who we've mentioned so many times on this, and he had a milestone. (laughs) That was a shout out last week from Joanna um, about, he wrote, he's published now 30 articles with us. yeah. Yeah, which is really cool. It's quite the milestone. So anyway, he helped revise this one, but there's so many links and resources in here. Even if you go, oh, I know what I can do with Python. Mm, You may not know all the things that are kind of like kind of under the hood. And it's just a great way in a nice narrative style to kind of just go through all the stuff. And I found this link that I was not familiar with. And it's actually a a link on python.org. It's Python success stories. And so there's this sort of gathering of success stories and they're in all these great areas like what's happening in VR, deliver, delivering clean and safe code, uh, healthcare, business, education, engineering, government, scientific areas, you know, obviously software development, which you've talked about many, many times. And there's, you know, there's stories on all of these and with lots of little extra, see all of the stories on those categories. So um, it's, it's very neat to see this sort of collection of success stories and what's happening there. And there are some huge ones already if you weren't familiar with them that you know Google has been using Python from the start you know you think about Python being used in the real world um we had Brett Slatkin on very early on on the podcast and he actually worked with Guido at Google right and talked about you know just his ability to work fast and do the server side kind of stuff that is really powerful inside of Google there and they they have you know Dustin was on recently and he talked a little bit about some of the tools that they have there also Instagram. I'm sure we've mentioned that multiple times, but it's like a huge deployment of Django. Um, Spotify, I'm going to mention today. They use it not only for lots of data science, but other things. And then we've had a lot of fun talking about space exploration, which is uh, somebody here is a big fan of. Um, (laughs) (laughs) we, We've talked about black hole research and of course, you know, NASA and robotics and the Mars rover helicopter, things like that all. It's pretty amazing to can have Python um, not only in the real world but in outer space too. So on other worlds, on other worlds, yeah. So then, uh, you know, wh- how you can develop software with Python, and we've talked about web development, Django, Flask. One of the newest additions to the group of web development tools is Fast API, and yeah. I'm hoping to maybe talk to Sebastian Ramirez on the show. He just had an article that came out just this last week, also about using Fast API to build. Python web APIs. Yeah. And it's, you know, written by the guy you kind of developed the library himself, which is very cool. Really kind of fun. And again, if you're into APIs or interested in building them, this is definitely what all the talk's been about over the last several months. And then, you know, what else can you build application-wise? Command line stuff, GUI stuff. We've talked so much about PyQt and everything from WX Python to, you know, the stuff you did in the Python Basics books with T Kinter. Yeah. Game development, I've had multiple <laughs> guests to talk about that because it's something that I find that's really fun. And then, you know, then the whole data science stuff and, and mathematics, machine learning, scientific computing. Each one of these headings has a section with just tons of little links and additional resources for you to kind of dive in. And, and if you're interested in wondering about, you know, thinking about something like the data and analysis and visualization section, it lists off like six of the libraries and additional resources, not only on real Python, but out there outside of real Python. We've talked about web scraping and then DevOps. You know, the whole thing that is very powerful with Python is you can use it to help automate so many things in, in your job. And that was the the title of the role I had back in Hawaii was a uh, automation engineer. And so I was building lots of those kinds of things within an organization and using this general purpose language to do that kind of stuff. Yeah. Anyway, it's a really great article, you know, gets down into like 
everything testing databases robots electronics and lots of fun stuff so check it out yeah you can definitely i think you'll find something new <laughs> yeah it's cool because i mean you think of programming i mean the first thing that comes to people's minds is like software development i think in a lot of or web development yeah in uh in a lot of uh cases which you know nowadays it's like i'm not even sure that web development and software development are two separate things anymore but yeah true but i was surprised one of the things i i recall talking about with you on one of the episodes was we we had found a i forget if it was a single article or it might have been a series of articles on how python was being used like in hollywood in the like movie oh, production yeah. space yeah we did that was fun and you know so there's that kind of stuff and also i recently found out I, i'm not really into animation or anything like that but but i recently found out that the uh, program blender which i know is used in a lot of animation yeah the 3d stuff yeah you c- is can be scripted with with python you know so it's just like there's just so much out there where python is being used that it's almost it at this point it almost feels like no matter what you're doing you might have an unknown need or it would be beneficial for you to, to learn a little bit of Python. Yeah. Cause it really is. It just seems to be like applicable in, in so many different domains. It's really impressive. Yep. It's a bright future. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah. Cool. What do you got next? First one I've got comes from Nikita Sobolev, who has, if you haven't heard of Nikita, he has kind of a GitHub library called dry Python He's into a lot of like kind of style guides and, and things like that. And he has sort of like an alternative style guide that he's developed for, for Python that's a little bit different than like Pep8 and, and some other things. But uh, he's got a new project that he's been working on called Classes. And it's this new concept. Well, the concept is not new, but it's potentially new for Python developers called Type Classes. And when I first saw this, I was thinking, is this somehow related to like data classes? Yes, I was just thinking. But it's not, it's not really, okay. it's not really that. So the kind of what the, what problem this is addressing is a common problem in programming of single or multiple dispatch, which uh, in, in Python, really, we only do kind of single dispatch if, if you want, and which we talked actually a little bit about that the last time I was on uh, the show with uh, the Funk Tools module. But to kind of lay out what this is, you have a function that needs to handle, say you have a function that takes a single, has a single parameter. And the way that the function behaves depends on the type of the argument passed to that parameter. So if it's a string, it needs to do one thing. If it's, you know, an instance of some, you know, custom class, it needs to do something different. Like it, it can take different data types and it needs to do things a little bit differently. So an example of this might be if you have a function that does something with a file and if it if the argument is a string it needs to treat that string as like a file path string like a string of you know file path and use like the open function or something to open it but you might also have it take a path instance from like the pathlib library or maybe even a file descriptor like you've got an open like a file you've already opened and you're gonna pass that file descriptor to it so you could conceivably take all three of those different types, but the way the function behaves is going to be a little bit different because each type has different things that need needs to do with that. So, you know, kind of the traditional way of doing this, or if, maybe not the traditional way, but the, the in Python, a common way pattern you would see for doing this would be using a big like if, else, if, uh, else statement to kind of handle all the different types. And you use something like the is instance function to check like if it's an instance of a string then do this if it's an instance of the path class then do this if it's an instance of or if it's a file descriptor you know do this those kinds of things so you'd you'd have this big if block well that means you've got this one function that's kind of doing a lot inside of that one function and from a software architecture perspective it might not be desirable to have something like that i could imagine it being slow to walk through that kind of tree Potentially, yeah, exactly. Especially if there's a lot of nested things going on within those, you know, if blocks and everything. So, yeah, the complexity can get can can explode pretty quickly. There's some ways that you can solve this. There's the the single dispatch decorator that we have in the Funk Tools module, where you can actually write several functions with the same name, but expect a different type. 
and you register them with this like single dispatch thing. And depending on the type of the object that's passed to the, the function, then it calls like the appropriate version of that function to do it. And now you've got a you know, nice clean separation in each of these things. It's a little bit easier. You know, the, each function is literally only doing one thing or handling only one kind of, of thing. So type classes kind of solve this, but they do it in a way that works with Python's typing system and can also be checked with MyPy. And that's kind of the advantage that this, uh, that this offers because that's something that you can't get with single dispatch as well. So the article is called Type Classes in Python. It, it explains where the problem comes through. It talks about, it gets pretty deep into kind of the architecture side of things and different ways to solve the problem. It actually looks at similar concepts in other languages. They take a look at protocols in Elixir, traits in Rust, type classes are actually called type classes in Haskell and to kind of see where the inspiration comes from and you know what are other languages doing to to solve this uh this issue and and these things so and the issue is not just the typing thing and there's there's a lot more to it than just that I've kind of watered it down a little bit to compress it into the the podcast but uh, the article explains everything that's going on so it's it's a really great article it's written really well it looks beautiful like that's one thing I like about Nikita's writing is it just very easy to digest, I feel like. And, you know, there's a lot of a lot of great examples and, uh, you know, everything's very thoroughly explained and the arguments are very clearly laid out, you know, so it's it's a it's a fun it's a fun read. So and if you're also interested, you know, in using this, it's in his classes. I say his there's several contributors, I think, right on this. The, the project is called Classes. And it's just a pip install classes. And we'll put the link to the actual GitHub repository in there. But just to list off the features real quick that he's got on the on the readme, provides a bunch of primitives to write declarative business logic and enforces better architecture, fully, type, fully typed with annotations and checked with MyPy, allows you to write a lot of simple code without inheritance or interfaces. It's Pythonic and pleasant to write and read, and it's easy to start. It's got lots of docs and tests and tutorials. So check it out if uh, if you're into that kind of thing. And yeah, I think uh, I think it's a cool project. Yeah, I'm, I have not checked out his blog before. And you're right, it's really well laid out. Um, I like the use of examples. And yeah, this is an area that I'm very interested in, <laughs> you know, as I keep going further and further, the, yeah. the idea of like, okay, well, structuring things and the, some of the advantages and disadvantages of all these extra structural stuff of things like protocols, right? Sort of thinking about how we should do types, <laughs> and um, right, I like that he gives all these kind of like, well, you could do it this way, you could do it this way, and and the comparison with the other languages is really nice too. Yeah, exactly. This episode is brought to you by Sentry, helping developers see issues that matter, solve those issues in minutes, and learn insights to keep their applications running at peak performance. What can you expect from Sentry? You get actionable insights and full context so you can fix your app's errors and optimize its performance. You get performance monitoring. Engineering managers and developers now have a single tool to trace Python performance issues back to poor performing API calls, as well as surface all related code errors. And with Sentry's error monitoring, you can understand the important events that led to each Python exception, be it SQL queries, debug logs, network requests, or past errors. Spend less time fixing bugs and more time building features. You can learn more at sentry.io slash 4for slash Python, or you can click the link in the show notes. So a recent development in the whole world of programming is out of GitHub, and it's this thing called Copilot. And the premise of Copilot is that what if you could have a peer programmer, you know, a person kind of assisting you with your programming, giving you like code suggestions and kind of like insights into different areas. Not that it would write everything for you, but it could maybe help in a lot of these different areas. And so GitHub went and trained this AI using, is it the GPL 
three thing. I'm trying to remember what it is exactly that the technology kind of under the hood that basically went through and looked at all the these public repos, which gets into a lot of ethical <laughs> yeah. uh, discussions. And I think I'm going to talk to some people soon about this. Um, uh, Josh Simmons, who I'm, is from Tidelift, has been talking a little bit about it on Twitter, and I, I hope to talk to him soon. And I think that might be interesting you know, for open source creators and you know how far can you really stretch a license. And anyway, so, but this is sort of a little... I don't know, proof of concept, this idea of like, okay, let's see someone using it. So this is a, from a, a blog by Sagandik Yurazayev. And he actually has a YouTube video of him doing this uh, programming. And so he started just writing things in to kind of see, he, you know, he, it's a closed beta. You have to be invited. I did apply. So hopefully I'll, I'll find out soon if I can get a chance to play with it. But he just started kind of dabbling around and he started to define a function that was just called start. Yeah. <laughs> and as he put it in start, it started to <laughs> help him create a text adventure suddenly. Yeah. And he was like, oh, this is interesting. Let's see where this goes. <laughs> and so, it, and it's interesting. It's not a real elaborate example of that. It, no. And as he kind of kept going, he, it would like suggest these rooms and these different outcomes and along with the text strings and your your inevitable death <laughs> or, <laughs> or success. It was very f- kind of fun to see. And I, as I was watching it and reading it, I remember it from this book actually is from uh, this instructional Python book that's pretty popular that was out there uh, several years ago. And I'm guessing the same example got typed into lots of people's repos. Yeah. Um, hence why it bubbled up so easily as an, uh, an example. I would guess there would be some kind of comparison and contrast thing that you know this thing wouldn't just take one example, but it might. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. So yeah, it's interesting. So it, it was really fun to kind of watch it do this as he's sort of tab completing, you know, all these things. It just sort of, you know, it shows you uh, very much an autocomplete kind of thing. And as you, you know, it's like, hey, it's almost like, hey, you're tapping you on the shoulder, you could go this direction. <laughs> and he's like, okay. <laughs> yeah. And then and then so forth. It, it's it's really kind of fascinating to watch. So it, it, if you'd like to see Copilot in you know, sort of in action and, and the kinds of things that it does uh, without, you know, having the the tool yourself to play with. Anyway, it's, it's, I don't want to get too deep into the whole ethical debate. I'm concerned about it somewhat. I think it's, I think it's intriguing. Um, other people have other weird qualms where, oh, this is just going to replace programmers. And I, I don't think that either I I, you know yeah. because we've already mentioned lots of other tools that help you with everything from you know testing your code or uh, looking for security vulnerabilities or refactoring your code there's lots of other tools that do other similar assistive things and i i think you still will need help creating things it, it may be like another layer of abstraction in a certain sense but it sure looks like it needs help um, as you even write something simple in here, you, you still need to kind of prod it in a particular direction if you think it's doing something correct. The probably the best other example I, I had heard about was, let's say you wanted to use uh, an, an API like uh, do send a text message with Twilio, and you can't remember what that looks like. <laughs> right. You know, like what are all the different argument kinds of things and and, and so forth. You know, it's it's sort of like adding you this helpful pre-prepared snippet that that I think I think that part would be kind of slick. It goes a little more, you know, a little further than autocomplete or your own saved collection of of uh, code snippets. Right. So, anyway. Yeah, it's it's an interesting project. I I'm not sure how I feel about it yet. I haven't I haven't decided. <laughs> yeah. Well, you haven't and used I, it too, right? <laughs> I haven't used it. Yeah, I I haven't even signed up for the the beta, but I mean kind of like my thoughts on it is I could see it, like you said, it's an interesting kind of like, oh, I can't remember how to do this. I remember like how it starts. Right. And then, you know, can I just sort of like tab it and like, oh, okay, yeah, I'll, that, that's, you know, it's jogged my memory and now I can, you know, kind of go back in and and fill out what I need to fill out. Right. I think it could have some interesting teaching applications. Yeah. Potentially. I struggle 
right now, again, this is with limited knowledge of how it actually works and, and limited research into all the issues and and obviously limited experience with it, um, zero experience with it. I do kind of struggle to see this, how this would be widely adopted by any, you know, software company. Like I just... Right, an organization. Or yeah, yeah or I would just, I, I kind of feel like uh, that's something that they p- might just stay away from for various reasons, licensing being one of them, but also just, uh, you know, quality uh, assurance, you know, and the whole idea of, you know, replacing programmers. First of all, I don't think that's what Copilot is aiming to do, or like right. that's even Microsoft's uh, or GitHub's intention with, with any of this. Like, I don't think that's what they're going for here, but uh, I'm not worried about that. I think that at the end of the day, it's people that use software and, because it's people who are using software, they they have feedback, and I don't think any AI is going to reliably interpret human feedback in a way that you know could then be used to like improve uh, the software or or things like that. I could be wrong, but I, I don't I don't think so. I just think that that I think it may be used in a way that isn't unlike Stack Overflow in some ways. You know, yeah, it, yeah. that people do end up copying lots of code out of there and using that those examples. Sometimes people use whole chunks of it, which is can be embarrassing. You know, like mm-hmm. um, I remember some story about a Stack Overflow code, you know, literally being in like a car manufacturer's code, um, which was really strange. You could actually see the, the you know, like actual <laughs> remnants of it coming from there. I'm like, oh, that's not good. But, you know, like it, if something can jog your memory or help you kind of move, push things forward, I, I can kind of see it. And, and maybe there'll be some kind of control over like how suggestive it is. You know, is it like Clippy? You know, <laughs> 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 it looks like you're trying to write an API. <laughs> anyway, so we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, definitely a hot topic and it's something that I will be kind of following and, yeah. and seeing, you know, what happens with it and would like to maybe play with it one day. I don't know if it's going to be monetized or if it's a tool that's, I, I don't know what their intent with that is. Yeah. I, I think it's going to be a paid product, but I don't, I have no idea what that will be. And you know, if, if there will be, it seems like there's always like kind of levels to that too, you know? Yeah. Uh, at least in open source. So it'll be interesting. Yeah, for sure. What do you got next there? So I got another one from our friend Leodonis. It's a uh, it's called Python's counter the Pythonic way to count objects, and we've talked a little bit about the collections module here on the podcast. This is another example of something that comes from the collections module, and it is very useful and one of those things that you know definitely falls into like the batteries included category of like of, of Python, which I guess most things in the collections module fall into that that category. But but this is, you know, all about counting things. And it might not be so obvious to you, uh, the listener, that like, do you actually do, do you actually count lots of things in in code? Like, is that, and well, yeah, you do. Like, it's actually an, an incredibly common thing that you end up, you know, having to do. It doesn't always necessarily look like counting necessarily but but it is something that get you know that happens a lot so the counter class makes it extremely easy to do this um like one liner kind of thing like then you're able to 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 count so the article walks you through like you know okay well how do you count objects in python let's say you've got a word a string with the word say mississippi and you want to count how many times each letter occurs in the string so the frequency of each each letter you could do that using like a for loop you could do that using a for loop and using a dictionary that uses like the, the dictionary git method to keep track of things. Like there's, there's a couple of different ways you could do that. There's another object from the collections module called default dict that you could also use in this situation to help get cleaner code in, inside of your for loop and all this. Yep. We've covered that one. Yeah. And, and, and so even though there's like, there's multiple ways to solve this and some of them look really nice and you're like, well, that's, that's really great. But, counter comes in and and really you you create a counter instance with whatever thing that you need to count the frequency of its things in so like you could just you know call counter with a capital c and then pass to that 
the string Mississippi, and you'll get a counter object back that already knows the counts of all those things. And you can do things like there's a most common method that you can use to find like what the most commonly occurring symbol is in the string or letter is in the in the in the word. You could get you know, the first two or three most common things. There's all sorts of stuff. You can update counts inside of the counter object. So you could like create it with some initial data. And then as your da- data changes, you could be updating things in the counter and just use it as a way to keep track of uh, of all of that. So the article walks you through setting that up, how you actually create a counter object, you know, how you can find the most common objects like we talked about, all this stuff. And then it gets into, you know, putting counter into action and doing things. So you could do things like count the letters in a text file, or if you need to alter that, you could even have it count words in a text file. Like you could kind of take that take that idea and run with it. And another example it gives is plotting categorical data with ASCII bar charts. So if you have a, a data set, you could use the counter to sort of count the frequency of those things and then create little uh, histograms in your uh, terminal with uh, these ASCII bar chart stuff. So there's that. And then he also talks about doing the same thing, but with matplotlib, but you still using the counter, the counter objects, combining that with matplotlib to you know get a little bit nicer code than maybe you would without using counter. A little bit of statistics, finding the mode of a sample and uh, counting files by type. So if uh, you're on working on a file system and you want to know how many files there are of a certain type or the distribution of file types within a folder or you know something like that. And then uh, the last section gets into kind of a little more theoretical and kind of a, a alternative use of counters, and that is using counter instances as multi-sets. So a multi-set is like a set, except that it allows multiple values of the same value, right? Uh, multiple instances of the same value. So if you, if, a, if you have a set in Python and you create a set with the values one, one, two, three, well, when the set's done being built, it's only gonna have one, two, and three. And no matter how many times you try to add another one to the set, it's never going to get in there because a set can only have one of each item. Multiset is different. It can it allows multiple instances of the same item in that set. So there's, this is uh, the multiset thing. So you can use a counter as a multiset or to kind of model multisets. Mm-hmm. And he gets into how you could do that using that, using counter and some additional things there. Counter is just one of those things, again, like almost everything in the collections module. I feel like when you learn about the collections module and you start using some of the things in it, you you feel like you've like turned a corner in your Python yeah. programming journey. And it sort of opens up a whole new world to you of like a way of thinking about solving problems. So yeah, it's, you know, we'll probably talk about more things as, as articles come out on this it's just a great module in the standard library. Counter is kind of a classic example of like a cool thing that's that's in it. So definitely check it out if you've never heard of the collections module, if you've never heard of counter objects before, I definitely recommend checking the article out and uh, learning more about that. You'll be surprised at how little code you have to write for some of <laughs> some of these things. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was surprised by the the explanation of the methods underneath that, uh, those kinds of additional things that it can do. Mm-hmm. Um, that part I haven't really explored. I'd explored the, the the base use of it in in different places. And the multi-set thing actually came up uh, when we were talking about those data structures, the whole video series that Christopher Trudeau did, but also the article that you know Dan had written. And that one came up, the multi-set, which sometimes is referred to like as a bag. Yeah. Um, is another term that people That's use for it. another term for it, so, yep. Yeah. So... Super cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm, this is one that, you know, you could very easily like slough off and go, oh, okay, I, I've heard of counter. It's like, no, actually you might <laughs> find some interesting stuff hiding in there. My next one is kind of continuing this theme of like, okay, how can you continue to educate yourself and practice my sort of summer theme also? <laughs> and uh, it's interactive coding challenges, 120 plus interactive Python coding interview challenges. Yeah. And it also includes this, um, uh, learning tool i've never used called anki flashcards but yeah i'm guessing that's how it's pronounced anki a-n-k-i i think there was a startup called anki that was like a little 
racing cars or something like that. <laughs> anyway, so it's a GitHub repo. And it's by Don Martin, who's like kind of the primary person behind the project. But there's a lot of people who are contributing to it. Another one, lots of stars, two, 23,000 stars. So, And the idea is, okay, I think we've talked about interview questions multiple times. But this is kind of fun. Not only is there like the flash element of like, okay, boom, you know, here's a random one of these questions for you to take on. Okay, how long did it take you to do? And you can kind of work through it. But it also, the repository includes links to Jupyter Notebooks of not only the problem, but also the test suite to kind of try to you know, go through and make sure that it passes all the different test cases. It also has details on you know, constraints for the tests. Are you testing for none? You know, things like that, you know, kind of weird input that you might get. And then sort of thoughts about like big O notation. And again, sort of the whole time and space complexities. It has a variety of themes, but some of the categories are like arrays and strings, linked lists, stacks and queues, graph and trees, sorting, recursion, bit manipulation, system design is a whole other kind of subcategory and object oriented design. And then data structures like build a linked list, stack, queue, binary search. And there's lots of those resources on real Python. If you, if you are intrigued in these kind of areas or would like some help, uh, this has some nice, I guess, kind of kicking you off in these directions. Or if you've kind of thought like, okay, I'm interested in the whole interview process and, you know, thought that maybe a whiteboard is in your future. This would, I think, be a really great resource to kind of at least practice with and, and think about. Uh, some of this stuff. And if it's totally new to you, like you haven't gone through the whole CS background, I think this could be a nice ancillary course to test yourself as you learn these topics. Yeah. What's so funny about it is there are these sort of, I don't know, I always think of them the, the hard way solutions of like, yes, you could go through for loops for finding every letter in a particular string and counting them or Hey, <laughs> there's the thing that we just talked about using the counter class, you know, the, to, you know, that's part of the collections module. Similarly, there's like tricks in Python for like reversing strings, right? You know, string slicing and knowing about that third element that can be in there after an additional <laughs> colon, you know, these are common things that sort of test. Yes, I can do this with Python sort of using it through like these sort of like course methods, but also I think it might expose a lot of these really interesting parts of the language, like enumerate and the, the whole additional collections module and all these other kinds of things that are in the standard library that, that I think might help you. So even if you were just to go and, you know, look at the solutions, you're still learning something and, and you can then come back and, you know, uses as a way to test yourself. And then there are other areas that can, again, you can kind of dive in a little deeper if you're interested in maybe the system design area. There's a whole set inside there too. Yeah, good stuff. This week, I want to shine a spotlight on another real Python video course. It's titled Understanding Python List Comprehensions. The course is based on a real Python article by James Timmons. And in the video course, Rich Bibby, shows you how to properly structure a Python list comprehension, how to rewrite loops and map calls as list comprehensions, supercharge your own comprehensions with conditional logic, and how to use comprehensions to replace filter calls. I think it's a worthy investment of your time to learn one of Python's most distinctive features and how you can use list comprehensions to create powerful functionality within a single line of code. Real Python video courses are broken into easily consumable sections and where needed, include code examples for the technique shown. All lessons have a transcript, including closed captions. Check out the video course. You can find a link in the show notes, or you can find it using the newly enhanced search tool on realpython.com. What do you got coming up next? My next one is, it comes from Andre Ro Roberg. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing the last name and, and he's listening. He's got a project called Friendly Traceback which I think is a really, really cool project. Basically, it allows you to, well, it, it helps sort of restructure the way a traceback looks in Python to make it friendlier to beginners. Yeah. 
and also adds some really cool kind of interactive components where if you if you do something you get it you get an error and you get a trace back like you're working in the REPL you get a trace back you can import a function called explain and run explain and it will give you some more context about the error that you that you saw so it's this fantastic learning tool and so it kind of it kind of serves two purposes there's a lot of like work that is going on to try to improve tracebacks in python to make them easier to read easier to understand and work with right i think that's something that we we discussed in uh i don't know a couple months ago and this yeah. kind of came up and i think it was it was another article yeah from the same author and this is more diving into uh the actual use in REPL. so cool yeah exactly and so that's that's one goal i think is you know to make tracebacks easier to read there's a lot of experimentation going on there and then the other thing is just to provide a tool for for beginners to use in a REPL to to get to to just learn more about what it is that they're seeing and help them understand the problem and which helps them eventually learn how to use tracebacks more effectively so it's called friendlier tracebacks in REPLs including Jupyter maybe we should explain what REPL is if somebody's like totally new <laughs> yeah, the REPL. We, we kind of skip over those uh, acronyms sometimes. That yeah, that's a good that's a good point. So REPL it stands for Read Evaluate Print Loop, and it's a really old concept in programming. It goes back, I mean, probably what like 70, 70 years or so at, at this point. But what it is is it's a it's a way of doing programming interactively, where yeah, uh, as opposed to you write. A, a file and then you have to you know execute that file or compile it and then execute it or whatever so you get instant feedback on what like a line by line as you as you write that's kind of the the concept of this another term for it or at least in python you'll often hear it referred to as the python shell so that's like if you just run python as an executable yeah uh, on your computer uh without like trying to execute a dot py file or anything you'll get the shell that has you know these this weird little prompt like the triple right angle bracket thing and you can type in a line of code hit enter and that line immediately executes assuming it's a complete statement you know if, if you leave like a parentheses open or something you'll get onto what they call like a continuation line where it's like waiting for you to like like it doesn't have enough information yet to like actually process <laughs> right if you're defining a function yeah exactly yeah, right yeah or yeah if there's like an indentation or something like that that it expects the you know, that kind of stuff. But basically you can type in a line of code and then you can immediately execute it and see what happens with it. So it's a way to to code interactively. It's great for experimentation. It's also great for learning. Definitely. Because you just get in, instant feedback and there's just a, such a low barrier to like, you don't have to then switch over to a, a terminal and run the file. And, you know, it's just all right there. So that's what, what the REPL is. And the tracebacks are things that, you know, you see that kind of when there's an, an error has occurred, you get this thing called a traceback and it, it like goes through, like, uh, you'll see a bunch, uh, sometimes a whole bunch of lines in there of like things that are happening. This is coming from the call stack, which is, you know, we don't have to get into all the details of, of that, but, but it's basically tracing through like where like the line of code was that caused the error and everything that happened like in between that to where you actually got the the error. Yeah. And at the very bottom of that big list of things, you'll see the actual error. Like maybe you tried to access something in a list on an index that didn't exist. Like you had a list of three things and you tried to access index three, which would be the fourth item in the list because Python lists are zero index. Then you would get this index error and that's at the very bottom. So you have to read these things kind of like from the bottom up. Yeah, we, we had a big conversation about that. Basically sort of errors are my friends with uh, Martin. <laughs> yeah. Way back, like early, early in the episode, I think is four, um, where we talked about this whole idea. But yeah, it's kind of strange that it's sort of inverted that you think you might want to read it like a book or a page. It's like, no, actually you want to go yeah, you from to, your prompt and then up. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you want to go up through it. But there's, you know, depending on the complexity of like what's going on, like it like it can be really, really hard to read these things because there there might be a lot of other function calls that are nested deep within like third party libraries or the standard library, things that are going on. And to actually find the line of your code where <laughs> where there's an issue <laughs> right. can, can be challenging. And so one of the cool things that friendly traceback provides is a where function. 
And so if you encounter a traceback in the REPL and you're using friendly traceback, then you can just type where and then with, you know, opening and closing parentheses and hit enter and it will actually tell you exactly where the error is in your in your code in a very nice friendly manner so like you don't have to like parse this entire uh, trace back yourself and there's like i said there's also this explain function that can be used to to get more context around like what's going on so like in this case of this index error if you get it and then you type explain and then opening closing parentheses then it'll say Remember, the first item of a list is not at index one, but at index zero. An index error occurs when you try to get an item from a list, a tuple, or a similar object, a sequence, and use an index which does not exist. And it kind of goes, through, it gives you some examples and things like that. And then it'll also tell you like, you know, where it was that, that this happened and everything. So it really, you know, it just tries to provide more context and, and, you know, make it easier for beginners to understand like what's going on here. One of the big things, so there's been a lot of updates to this project recently. And one of the things that's been added is support in Jupyter Notebooks. So now you can get all this because a Jupyter Notebook is kind of like a REPL. Yeah, it's fairly interactive. Yeah, you're kind of it's, running blocks. Yeah. yeah, you know, the difference between a Jupyter Notebook and like a tra- traditional REPL is that a REPL is in a, a sequence. Like, you know, you put in one thing and then it happens and then you do the next thing and then it happens the next thing. Whereas a Jupyter Notebook, you can kind of like run things out of order if you want to, like yeah. you have a little bit more Which freedom. Which is a complaint some people have with it. Yeah. <laughs> but Knowing the state, yeah. But there's a similar, you know, it's a little, it's similar in the sense that like you have, you can write code in a cell and then you run it and you get that instant uh, instant feedback from what you got there. So yeah, so now this friendly traceback is now working in Jupyter uh, Notebooks, which is really cool. So I think, you know, there's a lot of people in the data space that kind of start with Jupyter Notebooks. Right. As opposed to like a, a Python shell or, or something like that. And now, you know, this allows those people to take advantage of what friendly traceback does as well. Sweet. Yeah, so it's it's worth checking out the article uh, to get some ideas of how it is. It's it's even more worth checking out the actual project and and uh, installing it and playing around with it. But one thing I wanted to mention is just today, actually, I'm looking at the tweet right now. It was three hours ago. I happened to notice that Pablo Galindo, who is the uh, release manager for Python 3.10, 3.11, and 3.12, I think, mentioned that. So he's been he's been doing a lot of work on errors. In yeah, in, uh, in Python and, and tracebacks, and I know I actually know for a fact that he and Andre have had some conversations because I've seen it on Twitter. I don't know the extent of those conversations, but I have seen them, you know, interacting some. And just today, Pablo announced that uh, it says after a lot of work, we finished the implementation of PEP six five seven in Python three point eleven. Tracebacks will annotate where exactly the error is happening in your code, which is a huge thing. I think this is going to be amazing just to have that built in. It's kind of like in the friendly traceback, I mentioned, you know, this where function that you can type in and like, it'll show you exactly where it is. Well, in Python 3.11, which is still a ways off. I mean, we're still, you know, over a year, year and a half right. away from, from that coming out. Yeah. Cause 310 has been locked. 310 has been locked. Yeah. 310 is coming out in October of this year, 2021. And then October of 2022, we should see 311 come out. And it'll have this feature of just annotating it. And the picture, it shows that like you've got your trace back. It's, it's got like the line of code where the error is. And it's like underlined with the little like tilde thing, little squiggly line. And then there's like a little carrot, like the little the carrot symbol underneath the exact like character or characters in that where the error is. Like the example was like a, has a subtraction. Yes. Yeah. 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 Where there's uh you've got, you're trying to subtract a value from another one and they're different types and they don't support subtraction. So it's actually telling you that like, Hey, it's like the, the subtraction symbol, like this is what's causing the problem. Like you can't subtract these two yeah. things because they don't understand how to do that. That's great. Localization. I mean, usually it's just the line, right? You know, or, or maybe it's the, the word, not even that sometimes. Yeah. But it's always the next word. Yeah. And then, yeah, it's, yeah. The where is so crucial. <laughs> yeah. So it's, Cool news. Uh, it's just, it's, I think it's neat that Pablo is taking those initiatives and that's important to him and that they're, they're actually working on this stuff because I think that's an area. What's the pep number again? 657. Okay. Cool. Which I've not actually read that. Uh, that yeah. Pep, I'm going to include the links for it. That's yeah. why I wanted to grab it. Okay. 
Awesome. Well, that brings us to projects then, right? That brings us to projects now. So if you hear the name Luigi, you might think of the uh, brothers who are plumbers in the Mario Brothers games. And my project is named Luigi. It's a Python module. And the idea is that it's going to help you build complex pipelines of batch jobs. So be able to, especially in the data science world where you have this whole workflow of ingesting, extracting data, uh, transforming it, and then you know loading it back in, that whole ETL. We've talked about the whole, uh, we've had Kyle Stratus on to talk about data management side of data science and so forth. And this tool is created by Spotify and they've been using it, gosh, at, at least since 2012. And you can think of the kinds of jobs that something like Spotify would have to do. This huge data set of songs and artists and all this information and having to create like your own personal a list of songs that you know are going to be yours to listen to this week or new releases or whatever and it's just a neat project it's different in a way from we had Savin Goyal on to talk about metaflow and luigi is in my opinion kind of a lighter weight tool that is designed really more specifically about sort of watching this pipeline of batch jobs of you know having a list of these things that it's going to work through things that i like about it uh, it has kind of a cool like overall web interface that you can use to kind of monitor how your batch jobs are going but it does dependency resolution it's similar to like if you maybe heard of something called airflow it has some kind of similarities there i'll link to an article uh, titled data pipelines luigi airflow and everything you need to know um, that's a, another towards data science blog post it kind of shows it in action and a lot of the things that are happening with um, on-premises large data things are moving more toward these, you know, cloud storage solutions instead. So anyway, it looks like this tool is a little more agnostic. It was definitely geared toward Hadoop initially, but you can use it with lots of other tools and it just helps with creating the language of how to plumb all those jobs together. So I thought it might be a useful tool uh, for you guys who are interested in data science and digging in a little deeper into that stuff. Yeah, cool. So what do you got? Mine is a really funny and f- fun, both. Yeah, I like this one. <laughs> project <laughs> called Plot Text. And basically, the way to think about this is a matplotlib clone that runs entirely in the terminal and uses ASCII to show the plots. And I don't, know like if this is something i would like really use all that much but i do know that it's like one of the few projects that i've come across where when i saw it i was like i immediately have to stop what i'm doing pip install this and play with it for a little bit (laughs) play (laughs) so you know it had that effect on me it's it's really fun and it's i mean it really is like like if you were to take matplotlib code and instead of doing like you know import matplotlib.pyplot as plt you would basically just do like uh, import plot text as plt and then like your code would basically like you don't have to change anything else and then you would just get these like really fun looking plots yeah. in your terminal i mean it's got it it does scatter plots it does line plots log plots stem plots uh, you can plot multiple data sets on the same plot and it'll do like the coloring and you can change the colors of those and everything. It's got support for like double Y axes. So if you have two different graphs on the same plot, but they have different Y axes, you can have one on the left and one on, on the right. It does bar plots and histograms. <laughs> and I mean, it's just like, it's... I wonder if it would be useful in like a, the small displays, like for like a you know, like a circuit Python or, or other project where you may not have the ability to load a large mm, library in to, to display, uh, you know, a, a chart or graph with just using ASCII. Yeah. That's interesting. I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, that might be a kind of a, a place where you could actually, you know, use this. Yeah. I think of like a weather station or what have you, you know, with like a little display, yeah. but it's got support for a bunch of different colors and even like markers for your for your for your, for your plots and stuff and it's just yeah and you can even do like like the whole like subplots thing where it'll it'll print 
two different plots for you. And it even supports streaming data. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's like, it's so full featured. It's just, it's just amazing. And, uh, I just love that. Like someone spent so much time putting this together. It's, it's not that old. I mean, it, it looks like they first uploaded this. Well, I don't know how old the project is, but it's been only been on GitHub for like maybe a month or so. Hmm. And, uh, they've already racked up 617 stars at this point. So nice, pretty, pretty awesome. And yeah, it just was, yeah, like I said, it was just one of those things I came across it and I was like, I have to try this out. Like, I'm sorry, but (laughs) I'm not going to get any work done for like the next 15 or 20 minutes. I'm just going to play with this thing. Yeah. It's a, it's a really neat project. Like it plot text. All right. Thanks for bringing all these, uh, PyCoders articles and projects again. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Happy, uh, middle of the summer to everyone. (laughs) Ah, same to you. Yeah. We're, uh, you know, I'm down in, in Houston and it's starting. Well, we had a heat spell like the rest of the world, it seemed like. Right. Uh, yeah, a little totally. while ago, you know, but that kind of cooled off. And now we're we're kind of reaching that point where like the typical Houston summer heat is starting to really kick in. But yeah, it's uh, definitely the middle of the summer. <laughs> yep. It's totally the middle of summer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Take care. Yep. See you. I'll talk to you soon. This episode was brought to you by Sentry, helping developers see issues that matter, solve those issues in minutes, and learn insights to keep their applications running at peak performance. You can learn more at sentry.io slash or F-O-R slash Python, or you can click the link in the show notes. I want to thank David Amos for joining me again this week. And I want to thank you for listening to the Real Python podcast. Make sure that you click that follow button in your podcast player. And if you see a subscribe button somewhere, Remember that the Real Python podcast is free. If you like the show, please leave us a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey, and I look forward to talking to you soon.